My name is Vahid Chitsas, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning or this afternoon, I should say. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Will do. Uh, my name is Jeff Agostinelli. Uh, I'm a purpose and productivity coach, and I am coming to you from Asheville, North Carolina. Ooh, on the other side of the Mississippi River. Yes, sir. That's it. I don't even want to know how much you guys pay for gas. Like, don't even tell me. Like, it's, it's messed up, man. I wouldn't be it's able so to tell you because I haven't put fuel in my car in weeks. <laughs> so it's, I would be guessing, and it would be a horrible guess, I'm sure. <laughs> I got a friend of mine who was in Kentucky, who lives in Kentucky now, used to live in L.A. with us over here. Over here was like two ninety. Yesterday, I put like $3. I, he sent me a picture of like 67, 69 cents that he, I was like, it should be illegal for you guys to put the gas at that price. Like, it's ridiculous. That's amazing. So I, I almost want to drive there just to fill up. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but it made sense for a second. Yeah, so it's, prices are different. So here's, here's the question that I have for you. Mm -hmm. How do we create abundance? How do we attract abundance? What are some of the key elements that you think entrepreneurs should be implementing in their business and in day-to-day -day life to be able to attract that? Yeah, that's a really important question. Thank you. Um, I like to say trade out your routines for your rhythms, right? So it's like a lot of times we get really instilled with the like doing this monotonous routine constantly. It works sometimes, but for a lot of people, they get stuck in the, in the, in the rut of a routine instead of understanding how their personal rhythm works, right? Especially entrepreneurs. It's like we're all unique in our own ways on how we engineer productivity, on how we engineer the way that we work and the way that we best connect. So I find that the, the best way to do this is really to understand that like you don't have to do it somebody else's way. In fact, most people are operating by a values structure that is not their own. So when we can trade out like what we think we should be doing for what we actually get to be doing based on what we value, based on our individual values, our company culture and those things, we can really start to dance to the beat of our own drum, right? And we can really see that in order to create abundance, it's not just a, a linear or one dimensional conversation, right? So it's, yes, it's in business and yes, it's in providing a service or delivering a product to a particular person. It, it, that solves a particular problem. Like we get that, right? And I think so many times entrepreneurs forget the fact that nothing is isolated, right? Like if you're experiencing problems in your relationship, problems in your family, problems in your personal life, it is literally almost impossible to set that aside to the degree that you need to in order to really allocate the amount of energy required to drive your business because your bandwidth is tied up in other areas. So really understanding like how you operate and what fuels you based on your values is extremely important. One of the major ways I learned this, I have a 10 year old daughter and I'm also, also an ultra marathoner. So like I run ultra marathon distance, which is like 31 miles plus. So people would look at my lifestyle and be like, dude, you're a single dad. You're, you, you know, you're super present with your daughter and you run like 40 to hundred miles a week, which is insane by most people's standards as far as time goes. But like, those things allow me to do what I do in my business. They don't, t they don't subtract or detract or take away. They add to and really complement and allow me to be uber present with my audience because I'm fulfilled, right? Like I'm meeting my own needs. And if I'm meeting my own needs, then I can help meet my customers' needs and help them meet their own needs as well. We need to do a different video on how you do the the babysitting with your daughter because my daughter is only 15 months old and she's a total dictator. So I would definitely, there, <laughs> there needs to be another session for you to train all the dads because this little girl, I'm telling you, she's got more power in one of her little fingers. She just points at things and there's like avalanche of like eight, nine people that are on top of it to just provide. And the other day I was thinking, I was like, this little girl has more power in the household than I do. Mm -hmm. And that's it's scary. She's like a little dictator. So these, so we definitely need to do a training on that. For sure. <laughs> on how you do it. So now, what is your definition or, or, or understanding? Or can you give us a little bit more detail? What's the difference between abundance and overconsumption? Well, I mean, when I, for me personally, when I hear the word abundance, I feel it is a 
constant adding to, right? Like if I am abundant in love, if I am abundant in energy, it's a, it's an increasing and ever expanding, right? There is an abundance. There's a plenty, right? It's not a definitive, it's infinity, right? It is an ever expanding and ever continuing. Um, and remind me what the second part was? Overconsumption. Like Over, I think a lot yeah. of people are like, oh, I'm, I'm living. If I had a bigger house, that's abundance. Yeah. Like I'm trying to find out what the differentiation between overconsumption and yeah. being so going. consumption in general right like <laughs> i i typically relate it like this i draw this analogy right i used to be a live-in private chef for about six years and so i have a very you know intimate relationship with food and when people are consuming massive amounts of content reading tons of books i'm all for all of that like i am a, a voracious reader and a very hungry learner and i also realize there gets to be a balance between consumption and utilization, right? If we're just acquiring and just consuming, that is not abundance, that is false security. So if there's, if we really get to examine our belief system around what the meaning is that we attach to things. If I need a house in order to feel, if I need an extravagant house in order to feel important or significant or X, Y, and Z, especially for men, right? It's like, if I've got to compare you know what's, there's probably something wrong in that equation, right? If I need the Ferrari or if I need even like this car, so I'm keeping up with the Joneses, that's not abundance. That's actually scarcity in disguise, right? That's insecurity. That is, I need this so that. It's conditional thinking. Abundance for me personally, um, I'm definitely not like a religious person, um, but highly spiritual. I like to say, like, for me, I use the G word just because it, it's a, a vernacular that most people can connect with. It's like abundance is a God-given right, right? It is one of those things that we limit what we express, right? Like the expression of divinity is abundance. Look outside, right? Even if you look at like Chernobyl, for, an, for, ex, for example, right? Like the once that the radiation was quote unquote cleaned up over time, like it flourished, right? Like wildlife it was thriving there, like um, uh, plant life, like the, the flora and fauna there took off. Why? Because humans aren't there, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so it's, it's funny because we really put the governor on the, on expression, on whatever it is. And I really believe like, I'm not big on digging into people's pasts in order to understand the present, just enough to, glean insight right so it's like we're conditioned to be a particular way so a lot of our bs our belief systems come from and the other form of bs come from how we are raised and really like i had said previously like how we're conditioned to want what other people want and to place importance and to place value right to have our values misplaced or misdirected so it's like we're trying to fill this void that ain't even ours, man. Like it's really sad on some level too, because it's like people don't realize that they're in this rat race and in this cycle of overconsumption. But it's like the, uh, you know, in Italian we say it's agita, right? Like it's indigestion. And it's like you're eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And you can only eat so much before you get sick, right? Until you start to get bloated and sick and really like not well. I agree with that. I mean, I mean that's a good explanation because the other day I was just driving. Uh, I was driving to get to the entrance of the freeway to get back to 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 the office, and I saw within like distance of a mile. I've got on the freeway on that exit multiple times per week, um, and I never knew or seen the mountains behind because it's either been a foggy. Or, or smog, or I never looked up because there was too much traffic and I was doing too many things. So when I looked up, it was just like, it, it was like an aha moment that how much as human beings we have impacted our planet that even at, at a very small, like it's me looking up and seeing the mountain and it was it, like I lived in the neighborhood for 25 years and I didn't know those mountains were there. Amazing. And, and I was looking at it. I was like, wow. And I cherished that moment. It was like you took a kid to Disneyland and I was there for like 20 minutes. It was the same feeling. I was like, wow, this is cool. I, so when you said abundance, I was like, 
for me, abundance is just being able to look up and just see a mile and a half, two miles down the line where I could see it with my eyesight. That to me was like, this is abundance. This is, this is cool. You know, and this COVID-19 has made that possible. So a lot of people look at it as negative. I'm looking at it as positive. Yes, it's sad. A lot of people are going to lose their lives. It's, it's, I mean, our healthcare is going to be better for the future generation because of this. So yeah. their lives is going to impact our whole entire future for eternity. So we're definitely grateful for that, uh, that they have done that, that they're making medicine improve, right? But then at the same time, for a lot of us, you have to definitely evaluate the way we do things is that now I'm looking at these mountains. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I wish I had a couple of more people in the car. I'm like, dude, have you ever seen this? Like it was like a kid at the Disney. I'm like, have you seen these? Like these are little mountains right here by our place. And I didn't even know they existed till like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, this whole thing happened. Anyway, my next question for you, brother. How do you make your craft your business? So that's that's an interesting question because I, I think it's a double-edged sword, right? Like I think that on one side, too many people try and make their passion their business when they shouldn't be making it their business, when they should find something that they enjoy doing, but it's not their passion, right? Now, I also believe that our emotions, like how we feel, fuel what we do, right? So like being like your dharma, right? Like I really believe that everybody has something, a calling, a vocation that they're here to do. I think way too many people are confused and don't like pin it down where it's like, you know, the gas station attendant, right? Like their dharma is serving people in a certain way. And it's like, I've seen people and you probably have as well, where they're like really excited about what they do, even if they're just a gas station attendant or the but, checkout yeah. person at Whole Foods. They're like, they are in their role and they're like exuding awesomeness. And then there's people who are just miserable and like pissed off at life and they're not doing it well. So that's number one. But two, you got to have strategy, right? Like I'm all for having your craft and being really good at what you do. But like being like, for instance, being like a really good coach isn't going to show you how to craft a narrative in a particular way that connects with the person that you're here to serve, that gives them something that solves their problem and that invites them to work with you, right? Like you need a very practical and simple strategy to take that thing that you have honed over time, right? The, your, your craft or the thing that you're really good at and find a way to aim that gift at somebody who needs it, right? So there's, there's the misconception, I believe, with creatives, with um, even just purpose-driven entrepreneurs, like people who believe they're here to do something very specific with their business, uh, to create large impact, to affect X amount of people, or to like really help a particular type of person, is that they think if I like, they just kind of like open the doors, in this case, like launch the website, or like put up the Instagram page, put up the Facebook page, put up the LinkedIn page, and they're like, I'm here. And then they're like, okay, no one's, no one's beating down my door. All right, and then they come back out again, and they're like, it's I'm here again. For a moment. <laughs> right? and they're like, wait, aren't I supposed to have like a bum rush of people like knocking me down? And there's this misconception that like, as long as I'm really good at what I do, and as long as I show up, that people are going to want to work with me. But there's a very, like I said, practical, simple and effective way to really turn that craft into a business. And it requires learning how to do business, not just have a hobby, not just show up, but be strategic, especially when it comes to your time, right? Right now, everything's easier than it used to be. Like I've been in the online game for the better part of like 2012. I don't know if you know of Brendan Burchard, but I went to Experts Academy and did a lot of that stuff. And you know, a couple of years before that, did Marie Forleo's B school. So like I've been in the online game for like 10 ish years pretty heavily. And right now you can easily put up a one page site, put up, you can do, there's too much. Like talk about agita or indigestion. It's like people are just overwhelmed with the sheer amount of options. So being strategic to really understand what avenues you're going to use and use them well and apply your craft, as I mentioned, to your avatar or to your niche. I know we've all heard these words, but like drill down in a practical way and, and really using them and, and, and defining them and driving that vehicle, not just being like, all right, cool, I got my stake in the ground, but like iterating and, and just redoing things, like starting every day brand new uh, and being willing to show up and just serve but do it strategically. Uh, I so believe Jeff, the missing piece. Is there a difference between craft and passion? 
Yes and no. I mean, it's hard to just like, uh, words are challenging because it's like everyone has a different meaning behind it. So it's like, for me, I can say that they're the same thing, right? Like my craft and my passion, like I'm very good at coaching. That's my craft. It is also my passion. There's nothing that ignites my soul more than seeing someone have that moment where their eyes almost like, like it's like an unveiling or just like they come alive in a brand new way. So I, for me, I'm very passionate about that experience and helping to facilitate or produce that within another individual. And it's also my craft. I've practiced it for years. Um, so See, that's what I, think. I think if you take your passion and work on it and, 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 and add to it, fine tune it, sharpen it, I think it becomes a craft because yeah. I, I'm passionate about a couple of things, but I'm never going to turn those into my craft right. or my business. Yeah. Or at least my wife won't let me do that. So <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny, Jeff. You might you might have gone through this. The other day, one of my buddies suggested something for us to do. And I was like, hold on, I need to consult with my team. He's like, you mean you have to ask your wife? I was like, why do you call it on like that? I said, let me talk to my team. She's, he's all like, oh, you're one of those guys. You have to check with your wife all the time. I was like, let me just talk, talk to my team. I'll get back to you. So yeah. anyway, it is what it is. But you want to know something? When I want to buy her, or, or at least I get, most of the time I don't get the feedback that I like, but it's the feedback that's necessary. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to hear that sometimes. So I, I love it when people get on your case for your business and all that stuff. So if you are passionate, and you have your craft, you might want to go to other people and get feedback. You might want to do it in private, but be able to get the feedback so you could adjust. Now, talk about emotion and fitness. So I like to use those words together, quite frankly, like emotional fitness or like some people call it emotional intelligence. Um, you know, like that, that, that vernacular, so to speak, for me is a little bit dry, like emotional intelligence. That's why I like emotional fitness because I believe it's – it's something that gets to be exercised, right? Like we have a certain level of, like you just mentioned, being able to receive advice and like knowing that you need to hear it and acting on that instead of like being like, oh, you know, like what the heck? Like I really want to do this and like launching into reaction. The ability to, as an entrepreneur, I believe like the ability to be able to self-regulate, I guess, which is a psychological term of like to be able to self-regulate your emotions, to understand what you're feeling when you feel it can really fuel your business in, a, in an amazing way. And I've seen this time and time again, where I'll be working with people and they'll either like clear a hang up they've had, or maybe they're having a challenge with their staff or like they're holding on to some kind of resentment or harboring like something that they haven't communicated. And we kind of brush it under the carpet. We're like, well, how can like that little scuffle with, you know, um, the co-founder, like how could that really, you know, affect anything? That's not going to, you know, it's not going to cause any harm. But as soon as that conflict is resolved, it literally just like lifts, a, not only lifts a huge weight internally for that individual, but it has a cascade of events that happen in the business every single time without fail. And I really believe that like our ability to be able to, cause stress happens, right? It's not like it, you're an entrepreneur. It's like, you know that like every day shit hits the fan, right? Just, just today, like, Instagram yeah. is having issues. Like it's yeah. on like hourly basis. It's not even daily, brother Jeff. It's on yeah. hourly basis. I'm putting yeah. out fires. <laughs> so some like the refractory period, another term is like the, it, like from the infraction, like the moment something happens to when we recover from it, the shorter we can make that, the better. So when I use the term emotional fitness, I'm referring to like how quick can we recover and adjust from something, right? Does something happen and we're like, you know, finding people to blame and like cursing this out and like swearing over here. Sure, some F-bombs may happen. And at the end of the day, it's like, how quickly can you move into resolution and action? Because I also have seen like the successful entrepreneurs that I've worked with personally, they're, most of them aren't even phased by it, right? It's like something big happens and they're just like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, it could be tens, thousands, millions of dollars. And they're just like, huh, wonder how we're going to figure this one out. Instead of like, oh my God, like what's going to happen with this? Crazy? Like, oh, 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 like, and then, right? It's like that stress like blood pressure rises, there's literally like physiological effects of that. Uh, and we, when we're in a stress response, we don't have the resourcefulness that we do when we're in a, like a parasympathetic relaxed response in the body. And it's, it's one of those things that if you can really figure out how to, and this goes directly back to the initial question about understanding your personal rhythms, 
it's like, you know, when you're powering down at whatever time of day you do to get your time to like really replenish and recharge, you don't want to have your notifications on, right? Because if something comes in and it's like some huge catastrophic thing that you could flip out about, if you're taxed from the day, the likelihood that you're going to react instead of respond in a good way is extremely high, right? So it's like understanding your emotional resources and how to respond effectively instead of get really just like hooked or roped into whatever could possibly happen could literally make or break your business. I agree with that. I think I read that in a book. I think it was three feet from gold mm. that don't make decisions in the valleys of life. You don't make those Huge. decisions right there. I'm guilty of that on weekly basis, but at least I have read that somewhere and I'm trying to be conscious about it. I think yeah. it's that movement towards getting it as good as you can, as best as you can. I'm conscious about it. Yeah. I, when I make those decisions, I'm like, okay, I shouldn't have done that. Like, I know that. I kind of get on my own case. I'm like, I shouldn't have done that. Should have done this. Or I should have hold off on that. So definitely that. So, you know, you got to watch out for the peaks and the, and the valleys. So you and gotta, just on that note, though, too, it's, you know, we very, most of us, I'd say everybody I've worked with, and myself included, have a very predictable pattern of response emotionally to stress. And if we can understand what that pattern looks like, for me, I'm 100% Italian, right? Augustine Elli, my mother's maiden name is Antonucci. I come from a very fiery background, right? So I know for me, I launch, like, I, I, like literally my body's like engulfed in flames, but it's not. Like, it just seems like I'd like ignite like this. And I know that I cannot respond in that moment. I can't. I have to literally just like walk away, breathe. I have a few practices that really help. And I know that I get to go, I'm useless right now or whatever the words I use are. And I'll respond to that in X amount of time. Or I tell you what, let me get back to you on that tomorrow. Like right now I've got a ton going on and I've got to get back to you in X amount of time. Because like I know I've made some really shitty decisions in those states. And having those learnings have allowed me to understand like when to respond and when to wait. That's, the, I mean, that's when the level of awareness just goes up. And that's by practice. The only way I'm going to learn it is just like going through it, learning it talking to other people and and as a matter of fact right before our call i was talking to one of my friends and that was the the conversation we had on how sometimes we just gotta not respond to stupid people let them just be because even if you call them out even if you tell them they're stupid or this decision was bad or we discussed it you're breaking your 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 your, your, your promises your verbal contract you, you completely abolish everything that you promised to do but then that's not my, any of my business. I got to go continue to do what, what I got to do. So to me, it's like, but you sometimes need that reminder, which comes to my last question. How important is it to have a coach and a mentor? Um, <laughs> how, like, important, how, Im yes. <laughs> how important is air? <laughs> I mean, literally, it's like I, I look back at all the pivotal moments of my life. And like, I honestly have no idea how I would have gotten through the three or four things that I'm really like seeing in my mind's eye right now. Like I would have, I would have talked about launching into reaction. Like there's no way I would have gotten through that if I didn't have somebody who could effectively help me like understand and move through certain things. It's just huge. I mean, even right now, it's like, I'm, I've been a coach for years. I still have coaches I work with. It's something that like, if you want to go to the next level, it's really, in my personal opinion, obviously that's why I do it, is that if you want to get to the next level, it's like the quickest shortcut. I'm not saying that you'll never get there, but the quickest shortcut is to be around somebody who's already been there and like literally skip all of the crap that you would encounter, all of the quote unquote learnings or failures that you would encounter and have someone to give you direct feedback. Because if the, the amount, it's like having a coach in athletics, right? It's like if you have someone that could point out like a, a running coach, a buddy of mine is a running coach, right? And he does these analysis on treadmills. So you, you know, somebody will be videoed from behind and you can see even just if their foot is like going out a little bit, even if their ankle, if they pronate just a teeny bit, just this little tweak, right? This little 2% tweak can make you so much more efficient because when you're running like 50 miles, that one thing, every step is absolutely huge. But like, you don't notice that, right? But for a coach to point that out 
that could literally shave like hours off your run. It's insane. Yeah, a few people are asking how they could get a hold of you. Uh, tell them how, how, how can they find you? Yeah, just drop me a DM on Instagram at Jeff Augustinelli uh, and just message me. Let me know what's up. Let me know what resonated. I always love to hear like what specifically is the thing that was like, wow, like that really landed for me. Uh, and tell me more about that. Or I got this thing going on and I need help with X, Y, and Z. So yeah, just reach out on IG. That's the best way. Done deal. Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking this time and being here. We'll definitely need to do a couple of more videos and get yeah. all of that out. And I know a lot of people were asking a lot of uh, questions that we didn't get the opportunity to answer. So if anybody's got any questions, go ahead and send it to us or send it directly to Jeff so that way he could So Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to do more with you. You're super welcome. Cheers, mate. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. See ya.